Hi there, and welcome to Heard Online, a series of videos where we take a critical look at things that we have heard online about sleep or about insomnia. And today's article comes actually from one of our uh, students in the Insomnia Immunity uh, program who uh, asked about uh, this specific uh, article that she had read. And I replied uh, last week, I think it was, and I thought this was really interesting. I wanted to bring it up to the, the you know, to everyone in the larger community, in the YouTube community as well. So, um, yeah, the, um, the headline here is how waste gets washed out of our brains during sleep. This is from Medical News Today. And th basically what this the headline suggests is that we have some new information that explains how waste is washed out of brain, uh, our brains during sleep. That's, you know, what they're reporting here or implying that they're reporting. And uh, before we, I, th I thought we should actually do this today. We'll look first at why this can be triggering. We'll look at the actual study uh, that they're reporting on, and then we'll go back to the medical news today and see, like, did they, you know, do they actually have proof of like what they're reporting uh, in this medical news today article? Uh, so that's the plan. And and why why is why can this article be triggering? Well, the way I think about it is like basically it can it can make us think the following that okay. If sleep is important for clearing out waste, you know, waste doesn't sound good, it's probably not healthy for us. So if, if sleep is important for clearing out waste from the brain, then if I'm not sleeping that much, then that waste part is probably stuck into my brain. And that doesn't sound good. That sounds like it could uh, impair our function. It sounds like it could uh, potentially create some, you know, um, uh, some disease even like there's these implications. There's people in the sphere that talk about like a link between sleep and Alzheimer's. It, overall, it, it, this all, it all can be very scary. So I think basically this is why this article can be like, can be triggering, can be like alarming to read this. So with that said, let us actually um, take this first one away from the screen and let's look at the original article, like the, the actual data that this all comes from. And this is actually an article from Science, which is a you know very highly regarded uh, um, journal. And the title reads, Coupled Electrophysiological Hemodynamic and Cerebrospinal Fluid Oscillations in Human Sleep. And I like this, I like this title because it just describes you know, what, what this is about. There's no implied, uh, you know, there's not there's no interpretation of the data in the title, which is very nice. And, and now, with that said, I'll just tell you what they did, and then we'll take a look at the results. So basically, they took 13 um, adult males, or were they male? Adult subjects. There were subjects, 13 subjects, they were aged like 23 to 33. I don't remember the gender. Uh, but they had them sleep in, a, in an MRI machine with like a, an EEG, uh, you know, EEG electrodes on, so they could measure their EEG activity, as well as blood flow, as well as cerebrospinal spinal flow. You can imagine it's not very, uh, like, uh, not very um, easy to sleep in an MRI machine, which, you know, and there's only 13 subjects. So it's a small study, you know, the conditions are a little bit special. So that, to some degree, makes you wonder, like, how represented, how, how much does this represent what actually happens when we sleep? That, that's, that sort of hangs over this article in, entirely, I think, because of those circumstances. But that said... We, we talked about what they did. Uh, let's take a look at the results. And I want to show this mainly to show what, what, what are results, okay? So in, in, this, uh, in this figure here, they show like where, where they, the slices from the MRI machine and a ventricle that they looked at. And here is the occipital EEG spectrogram when uh, during stable uh, sleep and wakefulness and during transition. And you can see this is like this spectrogram and this, this is like what raw data can look like. And as you can tell, it's just like different colors and different like, you know, uh, colors of different intensity. And, uh, you know, that's the spectrogram. And here we have the behavioral response, which I don't know exactly how they measure that clicks per minute, but we can see that there was very little going on when this person was sleeping and there was a transition phase and there's more activity when they're awake. And, and this is their CSF uh, signal. Uh, and you can see the same, well, you can see a clear difference from you know sleep and, and wakefulness here. But my point here is just that this is raw data and, 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 and you can tell that this is, it's not like an MRI machine or EG you know, device. 
spits out like an interpretation. That's like says, hi, this is what we found and this is what it means. My point is that humans have to interpret this data. Humans have to create a story around this data. And often that story is what we always hear about, but this is what the kind of raw data can look like. Now, with that said, their main finding, you know, the, the, the thing that they focus on as, as the results here is, is really this. So uh, in, in A here, we can see um, an example of, you know, so the, 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 the green one here is uh, blood flow or a surrogate marker of blood flow. And uh, in the purple here is a surrogate marker of um, the surface spinal fluid flow in the brain. And this is this A here is doing wakefulness, and they're reporting that the surface spinal flow actually is coupled with respiration, which is not that surprising, like with changes in like our intrathoracic and you know pressure that propagates through our bodies, and that could you know we can see that how that could affect our, our surface spinal flow. But they're reporting that during sleep, we have these slower waves of uh, cerebral spinal fluid flow that is not coupled with respiration. A similar thing happens with blood flow, which seems sort of random here during wakefulness, but there are these big, slow waves during sleep. So that's, that's what they found. That's their main finding. And uh, how did they interpret this? Well, let's, let's look at uh, the the author's interpretation of this. So they're, they're concluding here that human sleep is associated with large coupled low frequency oscillations in neuronal activity, blood oxygenation, and CSF flow. They, in addition to what I showed there, they saw that in, in, in parts of the brain where there was a, a, a large amount of surface spinal fluid, they saw an association between elect, like the electrical activity in the brain and these uh, waves of blood flow as well as these waves of um, cerebral spinal fluid flow. So that's the conclusion. They're, they're, conc they're conclu concluding that human sleep is associated with this large coupled low frequency changes in neuronal activity, blood oxygenation, and CSF flow. That's their conclusion. Now they say, although electrophysiological slow waves are known to play important roles in cognition, our results suggest that they may also be linked to the physiological restorative effects of sleep, a slow neural activity is followed by brain-wide pulsations in blood volume and CSFO. So they're not sure about this. They're saying that maybe the electro, uh, kind of the electro, uh, you know, electrical slow waves uh, are linked to uh, the physiological, like us feeling more refreshed when we when we sleep. Which, but they don't know this. They're just this is just speculation. Again, uh, the only conclusion is the one we just read. Now, now they, they make a bold statement here. They say that these results address a key missing link in the neurophysiology of sleep. The macroscopic, you know, the big picture changes in CSF flow that we identified are expected to alter waste clearance. So this is interesting. They make a very bold statement uh, based on 13 subjects, which is you know, a very small study, right? But they're saying, they're not saying that that sleep or the, these changes in, in service spinal fluid that we're seeing with sleep will improve or enhance uh, clearance, but they're saying that it will alter it, meaning they don't actually know how this, like if you have small kind of changes in um, service spinal flow, uh, uh, flow that is coupled with breathing versus larger kind of waves that are not coupled with breathing, they don't know if one or the other will like lead to more uh, clearance of waste products. They don't know that. They just say alterations. I think this is really, 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 really um, interesting uh, to to point out. And the rest of this is really just again, you know, more speculation. But that's 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 that that those are the results of the study. So with that said, uh, now we know about the study. Now we can go uh, to the um, the article from Medical News Today and and look at you know. What they reported and how well that actually uh, aligns with the original study. So, how how waste gets washed out of the brain during sleep? That again, uh, you know, having seen the original article, we can't really say that we've now found how this washing out process happens. And the the entire idea of waste being washed out during sleep, um, I I don't think has that much. Um, um, is, is that not very foundational? I looked at the the 
so the original article where that idea come from and it was a mouse study that was studied from from mice so very unclear how how that really affects us humans but anyway that was the that's a few notes on this uh headline they're saying for the first time a new study has observed that cerebral spinal fluid washes in and out of the brain in waves during sleep helping clear out waste so this is this this last uh you know um these last four words of the the introduction here was not supported by the uh by the original article and makes all the difference so they can say that yes we saw these you know waves but we they wasn't clear at all that that helped clearing out waste which makes all the difference right when you when you when you read this article if it had just said and we don't know how that affects this potential waste uh you know um uh, uh what's the word you know waste flowing in another break we don't know how that it affects it it would have been totally different you know than than what they're saying here with this this could be triggering when it when it suggests that sleep is important in creating that waste right so uh, that's one and then uh similar to here in bold they say now researchers at boston university have found that during sleep the fluid present in the brain uh cerebral spinal fluid washes in and out like waves helping the brain get rid of accumulated metabolic trash not really they've just seen the waves they've not seen anything else uh, I felt there was maybe one more thing that I wanted to point out. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. What are the causal links? Uh, so the, the, the authors themselves say that uh, they haven't they haven't really found anything that's causal, and that's um, that, that that's actually I think super important. So anyway, I think we reviewed the original article. Uh, we reviewed the medical news story today. And uh, to me, what I always like to point out is this. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that short sleep or insomnia causes any health issues. And this article, again, absolutely nothing causal about this. was not a double-blind, you know, placebo-controlled interventional study where they did this to one cohort and this to other cohort and saw what happened. Not at all. Uh, and Still to this day, we have no such evidence, and also no evidence that short sleep insomnia causes any waste product uh, uh, elimination problems in the brain. There's no um, randomized studies, no causal links whatsoever. It's all really just ideas, speculation, and thoughts like that. Which, which now, the, as I was preparing for this, I was as I was reading this article, it sort of led me to a a bigger question, if you will, which was this one, which is how much faith do we have in in the human body, right? How much faith do we have in the human body? When you read these articles, it is implied that sort of the human body is very fragile and we, we need very ideal circumstances, uh, et cetera, or else something might happen. Something like this. This, this like, I have these two questions that came to my mind. One is this one, like, do we think that the human body requires a narrow specific or an ideal amount of things like sleep or macronutrients or micronutrients or exercise or sunlight or it would develop some disease or do we think that the human body is this you know survival machine that is designed to compensate for a large range of circumstances and and that it is like everything else in nature it just it just wants to survive and it, it has a, 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 a capacity to, to thrive and survive in, in, in many diff very different in many different circumstances, I think uh, personally that um, you know everything that's alive it, it's it's designed to survive and it, it can compensate for many 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 circumstances, including like staying up and playing like video games uh, at night. Like a, a, I think we're, the human body is very well capable of doing that. It's also very well capable of you know uh, being in a state where we think we're under some threat, right? That's basically what happens with insomnia. We think that there's something dangerous, something that's happening, and we stay awake more because of that. And that's a survival thing. And I think the, the human body is very, very uh, uh, capable of, of staying alive, surviving just as well when it thinks there's some threat as when it thinks there's no threat. That's my opinion. But anyway, I hope this um, helped clear out some uh, um, clear some doubts or, or some worries and some 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 stress around the whole idea of uh waste product elimination and things like that if you have read this particular article i hope uh, this uh, this was helpful uh, as always uh let me know what you think and also as always uh if you find yourself doing really well 
uh, perhaps thanks to the free information here that that's fantastic to let us know. Uh, but as always, if you feel like, you know, you're not really feeling like yourself, you're scared, you would like some more help on your path to sleeping well and leaving the struggle forever, then of course, head over to our, our website and uh, if you want to talk to me, I'm available. You can talk to me, Coach Michelle, or you can join uh, our Insomnia Mini program or bedtime as well. Many great options for you if uh, you'd like some more help. So with that said, uh, thank you for today. And uh, uh, tomorrow we have uh, uh, Insomnia Open class where I'll answer questions from the community. So uh, for those of you who attend, I'll uh, look forward to seeing you there. Bye for now.